church, welcome to Easter Sunday. It is finished, it's all over. He's resurrected, he's risen. The tomb is empty. Well, let's live that way, that Jesus Christ is who he said he is. He's come back to life. He's left us with the power of his Holy Spirit. So let that be a celebration. Let your life be a celebration of the goodness of God through his forgiveness and his grace. And this morning, we pray that this message will absolutely bless you and equip you to live out your Christian walk with great confidence in who Jesus is. Father God, today, as we come around your word on this Resurrection Sunday, Lord, we give you all the glory and the honour and the blessing that's due your name. Lord, we thank you for your resurrected power. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that the same Spirit that rose Christ from the dead dwells in our bodies. It's our portion today. And so, Lord God, be glorified through your word. And I pray, Lord, that your word would minister to each and every person that hears it today. In Jesus' name, that we would all walk in that resurrected hope that you give us through Christ. And all God's people said... Amen. You can find your seats. That's awesome. What an incredible moment in worship when the, the power goes out. And, uh, but the power of God is greater than the power that went out. And uh, we just kept powering on uh, in God. And uh, I want to commend the team um, for not being flustered or you just kept going. And I love that. And um, it was a little bit flustering though. And we're just trying to work out what's going on here. And uh, the fact that it kept coming back on was a good sign. And um, the fact that we have it on now is an even better sign. So if, if you want to follow along with what I want to share today, there are notes provided. And if you'd like a copy of those notes, um, just raise your hand and our um, hosts and ushers will be able to get you a copy. Uh, the, the title of the message today is A Resurrected Hope. It's Resurrection Sunday. It's when Jesus got up again. They went to look for him at the tomb and for somehow the, the stone had been rolled away and the body was gone. And to those that were inquiring, they were swiftly told, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Jesus, our Saviour, was resurrected. And today, I believe that he wants you and I to walk in that resurrected hope. There's a great story that I've shared with you before around hope. And one of the early explorers of South Africa's ocean waters, Bartholomew Diaz, went around a cape on a stormy sea. His ship threatened to go to pieces, so he called the place the Cape of Storms. But later, Vasco da Gama, who came later, changed the name of the, co the cape to the Cape of Good Hope. For as he sailed around the cape, he saw ahead of him the jewels and the treasures of India. You can call this life a life of storms if you wish, but if you can see the glorious redemption of eternity ahead of you, you can call it what it is only in Christ, a life of good hope. And today, God wants to resurrect hope in your life and in your circumstance. I've just got six points today. So you can stay up, up to speed with me and you'll be able to follow through where we're up to. And the first point that I have today, the reason we have more hope than anyone else is because we're being completely forgiven. You and I have been completely forgiven. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in Christ we are set free by the blood of his death. And so we have forgiveness of sins because of God's rich grace. You know, everyone's searching for the truth and there's kind of a new phrase that's uh, being bandied around, well, my truth is, my, my truth is this. And it's kind of the truth according to me. Well, can I let you know the truth this morning, that unless you are saved through Christ Jesus, you don't experience that hope. Unless Jesus comes into your life and into your world, you can't be set free. You, ourselves, our own mechanisms, who we are in ourselves is not enough to set us free. We can try and do good and be good and all of that, but our salvation isn't hinged on who we are as a person, it's who God is as a person, 
living out through us. And the Bible's clear that if you want to be set free, you're set free by the blood of Jesus, his death and his resurrection. That's how we have forgiveness of sins. I love it, the way it reads in Isaiah 53 verses 6 to 10 in the New Living Translation. It says, all of us have strayed away like sheep. We've left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him, Jesus, the guilt and sins of us all. From prison to trial, they led him away to his death. But who among the people realized that he was dying for their sins and suffering their punishment? I, I love that picture. You know, here's Jesus being uh, wrongfully accused and being led away to be punished and put to death. And, and it was quite a gruesome death at that. And yet the people that were actually officiating in his death were the ones he actually came to save. <laughs> it's like there, was, there needed to be an aha moment for those people. But he was buried like a criminal. 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 A criminal. Then he was put in a rich man's grave. But it was God's plan that he should suffer. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have a multitude of children. Jesus was handed over to die because of our sins in Romans 4.25 and he was raised from the dead to make us right with God. That's the great promise that God offers us through Christ Jesus. It's not what we can do for ourselves. It's what God can do for us. He makes us right through Christ Jesus. He makes you right. You go, oh, I'm all right, thanks. Yeah, well, that, that's nice. But if you want to be right with God, Jesus Christ makes you right. Number two, we're no longer afraid to die. Why do we have more hope than anyone else? We're no longer afraid to die. I could do the Formula One victory shake, if you like. <laughs> Everyone gets a bit. <laughs> we're not doing a shoey. <laughs> We're no longer afraid to die. Jesus promised, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die like everyone else, will live again. What a great eternal promise. Why do we have more hope than anyone else? Because we know that this life isn't it. That there's so much more on the other side of this life. But what we do now is critical and crucial to how we enter in to our eternal life that we understand that Jesus Christ has forgiven our sin. Do you know what that tells me? That there isn't anything that I could do that's going to keep me out so long as I come with a repentant heart and ask for forgiveness for those things. That he welcomes me in and he wipes my slate clean and he says, I'm going to empower you to live a new life, a new and living way to live and to walk. He doesn't forgive us of our sins so that we keep going back to them. He forgives us of our sins that we turn a whole new way and we walk away from the life that leads us astray. And he welcomes us. He's the resurrection and the life. And Jesus Christ today wants to resurrect things in your life. He wants to resurrect hope and give you a future. In Acts chapter 1 verse 3 it says, For 40 days after his death, Jesus appeared to many people in many times and in many different ways that proved beyond doubt that he was alive. They saw him and he talked with them about the kingdom of God. Friends, it's not just a story. There were witnesses. There were people who saw Jesus again as he was resurrected to a newness of life. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture says. I love this. It's in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8. He was buried, then he was raised from the dead on the third day, and he was seen by Peter and by the 12 apostles. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive at the time of this writing, though some have died now. Then it was, he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, I saw him too, Paul writes. Point number three. God's spirit inside us enables us to go again. Go again is our theme for this year and I want to declare that over you today that you can go again you can rise up 
Yes, there may have been disappointments in your life. There may have been mistakes. There may have been things that haven't always added up. But God's power through his spirit is enabling you to go again. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power and you will tell people everywhere about me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. In Ephesians chapter 1, 19 and 20, I pray that you begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe him. It is that same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. What's the power? It's the power of God's spirit activated in your life. You might say, well, how does that apply to me? How, How does that mean something to me? Well, let me put it to you this way. If God's spirit can raise a dead Jesus, he can raise a dead marriage. If God's spirit can raise a dead person, he can raise a dead career. If God's spirit and resurrection power can raise a dead man, he can raise a dead dream. He can raise anything in your life. God has the power to resurrect things in your life that may have brought you down, but he may be able to turn it around through his miraculous life-giving power. What is the power? It's the power to free you from your past, the power to break those memories that have been holding you back, the power to start over when you feel like giving up. It's the power to change things you think you could never change, but in his power and his strength and in his provision, things can turn around. It's the power to overcome habits and hurts and hang-ups that hold you back. It's the power to keep going when you feel like giving up. It's the power available to you and to every person on planet Earth. It's the resurrection power that gives us hope. It's the reason we have hope today. It's the power of God for us to go again. Number four. Everyone say number four. four. You say we're ripping through this. (laughs) We're ripping through this. God will never stop loving us. Why do you have more hope than anyone else on the planet today? Because God will never stop loving us. Isn't that good news? I love what it says in Jeremiah 31 verse 3. God speaking, I have loved you with an everlasting love. You know, when you're driving in your car and uh, one of the the little dials you watch on your dashboard is the fuel. And the more you drive, you just watch the needle go and slowly running out. How much much further will we get? And you have the little computer uh, in these modern cars, the little computer comes on. Can I say, don't trust the computer? (laughs) (laughs) You say, are you speaking from experience? Maybe. (laughs) Don't trust the computer. But we watch things run out. We watch things in our pantry, in our cupboards, run out. Remember when you were at school and you had to go into the pencil sharpener and sharpen the pencil? It was fun. But the pencil kept getting shorter. You know, things in life run out. It's like money just slips through our fingers. But not with God. God has an endless supply of love. An endless supply. It's an everlasting love. It's not just for a season. When you think, oh, wow, everything's going so well in my life. God loves me. Yes, and he loves you when things start going poorly in your life as well. It never changes. He loves you with an everlasting love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever, not just those who do, whoever, open invitation would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life for God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world but that through Jesus Christ the world might be saved it's a sure and certain hope that we have that God will never stop loving us In in 1 John 3, 10 and 11, it says, this is how we know who the children of God are. Anyone who does not obey God's command and does not love others is not a child of God. We must love one another. 
We're, we're so encouraged through God's word to love one another. I don't know if you've had opportunity to watch uh, the Good Friday message uh, that, that we posted online from Shane Willard, We're talking about hostility and peace in our world and how we as Christians are to respond when things get a little bit hostile. It, it's right in this verse, we're to love one another. I want to ask you some questions this morning. How has the love of God changed you? Has the love God demonstrated towards you changed you? Has the love God demonstrated by not treating us as we deserve changed you? How has God's love changed you? They're good questions to consider. Because God's word says that when he loves us, and we obey his commands and we love him, then we're actually called children of God. God wants to include you in his family. And the great news is he never stops loving us. In Matthew chapter 18, we get this incredible story. And it's Jesus speaking, telling another one of his famous parables. And it says, The kingdom of heaven can be, pe can be compared to a king who had decided to bring his accounts up to date with his servants who had borrowed money from him. And when it came time to come to a certain servant who owed, in some translations it says millions of dollars, he asked for mercy and said, oh, can I just have a little bit more time? Can, can you have pity on me, king? Well, the king did take pity on him and removed the whole debt. Oh, what, what a great king. He, he wiped the whole slate clean well that servant that had just been set free of the great baggage and and noose around his neck went out to find another servant who only owed him uh, several thousand dollars and then put pressure on that servant to say hey where's my money you owe me come on pay and that servant asked for pity and mercy but the servant who'd just been freed said no you pay me now. Well, some other people witnessed this and they told the king. He was hauled back in front of the king and said, you evil servant. Why didn't you use the same grace and the same love and the same mercy that I afforded you to the one that owed you money? This is what this verse is talking about. It's remembering God loved you with such a rich, unending love, full of grace and truth. Yes, full of mercy and justice. And if God's treated us like that and wiped our sin clean, then what right do we have to be harboring judgment and ridicule against other people? It's the Bible's words that if we want to be known as a child of God, we're to love people. We're to remember what God has done in us because of Christ Jesus. I ask you that question again. How has the love of God changed you? Has it changed you? It's such an incredible story to understand that all your worst fears of being separated from God, the things you know you got up to that no one else knows. You know yourself better than anyone else. God knows you better than you know yourself. And we can pile up all those things and say, oh, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. I couldn't come, I can't do that. God wouldn't want to see me today. I, I shared on Friday that the great posture of the cross is open arms. It's saying whosoever will come will find grace and forgiveness. Not to have your faults leveled against you, but to have them washed away by the blood of Jesus. To give you a new, a new start, a new future and a new hope. My prayer for you today, this Easter, is that the love of God changes you, changes your approach to who he is. To be in his presence. Point number five, why do we have more hope than anyone else on the planet? 
we know the purpose we're created for. Your life is a gift from God. Sometimes we think, well, it's my life, I'll do what I want. I'll do what I think's best. Yep. It's not, though. Your life is a gift from God. That's why we do baby dedications. We say, Lord, thank you for the gift of life and of children. And as now that you've given them to us, we give them back to you. Lord, that you would raise them in your ways and that you would help us with grace and mercy to raise our children in your ways. Your life is a gift from God. Your purpose in life is to know the giver of that gift. It's a great purpose to pursue. Your purpose in life is to share your gift with other people. Your purpose in life is to help other people know that they too are a gift and for them to know who gave them that gift. In Psalm 138, it says, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me because his love endures forever. Every single person in this room has purpose. A purpose under heaven. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. We looked at this verse on Friday. Jesus said, my purpose is to give you life in all its fullness. John chapter 10, verse 10. After the resurrection of Christ, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, then millions of people became followers of Jesus Christ. Today, that number would probably total the billions of people who have responded by giving their hearts and lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But back in the day, the Roman Empire became scared. All these people started following Jesus and started doing different things that they were no longer concerned about being under the Roman rule. And when people were discovered to be followers of Jesus, the Roman Empire started what was called the Great Persecution. And for the first 300 years of Christianity, it was illegal to be a Christian. And if you made the, de the decision to say, I'm going to become a follower of Christ, you were more than likely fed to the lions, sent to the Colosseum, or even crucified or beheaded yourself. It meant ultimately, probably, certain death to be a follower of Jesus. People were signing their own death warrants by saying, I'm going to become a follower of Jesus. Why did they become followers then? Because of the hope of all the things we've discovered, just discovered and covered. It's because of hope. There's a better day. Did you know that all the original 12 disciples Every one of those guys were murdered except one, John. Stephen was stoned to death. James was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was in prison in Rome. And then he was executed. But his last words, right before he goes to his ex execution, says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. What a great attitude. What a great attitude. It's going to cost you something to follow Jesus. But what will it cost if we don't share the good news with anybody of the certain eternal hope that we're about to face? Christians were fearless in the face of death because they knew there was more to life than just here and now. What baffled the Roman Empire was how unafraid Christians were to die. Paul said it like this, for me to live is Christ." To die is gain, or even better. Either way, I win. I'm alive. I'm, I'm just going to live my purpose, the purpose that God created me for. But if I die, I go to heaven sooner. I can't lose. What do you do with a guy like that? <laughs> now, the Australian media doesn't report any of these types of statistics. But it, there's statistics that are readily available. About 250 million 
of Christians live in lands where they're per persecuted for their faith every day. In fact, about 90,000 Christians are killed every year right now. For the last 10 years, it's been over a million believers. Christian believers who've decided to live for Jesus. And you've got to ask yourself, why is the Christian faith so persecuted? Because there's a hope that people can't understand. There's a hope that living for Jesus will mean something. And yet the whole world that's, that's anti-Jesus, anti-Christ, can't realize we're here to bless them. We're here to give them a message that will set them up, not just for this life, but for the one to come. And I, knowing what I know, find that very hard to comprehend that I've, I've got, let, let, let's just say, if I've purchased a product and it's good and it does everything it says on the label and more, I'm going to tell people about that. Man, you've got to get yourself some of this stuff. Oh, it, 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 it's revolutionary. Like, it, it doesn't just remove the stains, it's like the garment's brand new. It's amazing. You're going to tell people, aren't you? If you have a good experience, you're going to tell people. So why is our faith any different? When we know what God has saved us from and called us to. I want to be clear this Easter that Christianity isn't just a, a mod con. It's not just a, a, a little belief system that helps us do life for, and, and makes us all feel warm and fuzzy. There's an eternal purpose to why God has called us. If you read the last books in your Bible, particularly Revelation, it talks of a day and a time that's coming where we need to be living ready. It's a time called the tribulation. And I just hazard a guess that it's coming sooner than we think. You say, what's the tribulation? It's a period of seven years following the rapture of the righteous. You say, what's the rapture of the righteous? This, this is my end times theory. You may want to argue it, but this is the one I believe. That those who are alive in Christ, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, they call upon his name. The word says that those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no other way to heaven. The world will want to tell you just being good will get you there. The world will want to tell you that if you're a nice person, that'll get you into heaven. Uh, there's people that don't even acknowledge God and yet they still think they get there. There's only one way to get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. The one that was resurrected out of the tomb. The one they came to find that wasn't there. Now we're told Mary went to the tomb and she couldn't find Jesus. So next time I lose something, don't ask me to have a mum's look or a, or a woman's look. She couldn't find Jesus. <laughs> That's a joke. It's a good one though. I'm losing stuff all the time and say, well, did you have a woman's look? Well, I don't know. Mary couldn't find him. <laughs> but friends, there's a tribulation that's coming. And what's the rapture? It's for those who, who have acknowledged Christ Jesus. They're caught up in the heavens. For those who haven't accepted Jesus Christ, there's a terrible seven years on the planet coming. And it'll be unlike anything that we have ever seen before. You think the world's on a downward slide now. Friend, if you miss the rapture, you will have an opportunity to get your life right with God, but it won't be something that's easy to bear. There's a time coming, according to the word of God, of gross darkness, chaos, devastation of all things, and progressive judgments of God as recorded in the book of Revelations. This message is both one of celebration but one of warning. That we must live to have our life right with God. It's important that we deal with things quickly and swiftly. Sin that may creep in and we somehow make allowances for. But understand all sin doesn't bring any glory or honour to God. Don't listen to people who say, oh, you've got plenty of time. 
Friend, I'm here to tell you today we don't have plenty of time. Yeah, you may argue in, in all the scriptures, you know, they said Jesus is coming soon, coming soon, coming soon. Well, today's another day closer to soon. I don't know what the time stamp is. But when I read about end times, wars, threats of wars, rumours of wars, all the things that are set out in a timeline, friend, can I give you the encouragement today? The only way to be sure is to get your life sorted out with Jesus today. This is the purpose of us being on the planet is to help gather others into the kingdom of God by presenting them with the truth, the love of God through Christ Jesus, that he's laid his life down for them. He was resurrected so that you too can have a resurrection hope. What's our job is to preach the hope of Jesus, soon return, and if necessary, use words. Be kind. Be gracious, be loving, but keep pointing people towards Jesus. There may be some that'll whack you for it. They'll abuse you. But tell them anyway, because they may not receive it from you, but someone else might come along. The Bible says sometimes we plant a seed, someone comes and waters the seed, someone comes and harvests the seed. Be a seed planter. Who knows, God may use you to be a harvest. Someone's ready to hear the message. But they're ready to hear it when you offer it in love. Number six. And everyone goes, Phew. We have an eternal home waiting for us. Why do you have more hope than anyone else on the planet? We have an eternal home waiting for us. We've been born into a new life which has an inheritance that cannot be destroyed, cannot be corrupted, cannot fade away. That inheritance is kept in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1 4. No eye has seen, nor ear has ever heard, or mind has ever imagined the wonderful things that God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2 9. I love this verse, Ephesians 1 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be opened so that you may see and understand the hope to which God has called you. You might ask the question today, does that include me? Are you including me in this, what you're talking about today, Pastor? God included you right from the moment you're in your mother's womb. He would say, I've known everything about you from the moment you were conceived. I saw you, formed you in your mother's womb, and I've loved you every day of your life. There's never been a moment of your life when I was not paying attention to what was going on. God would say to you today, I've seen your ups and downs, your highs and lows, the good, the bad, and the ugly, but I've never stopped loving you. I have a plan and a purpose for your life, God would say to you today. I want you to have your past forgiven and have a purpose for living for the, the home made in heaven for you. But you have to trust me. I made you to love you. And I want you to learn to love me back. I want you to learn to know me. I want a friendship and a relationship with you. The great story of God's love and grace is for you. He never intended it to be one-way traffic. It's a relationship. He loves you and he wants you to learn what that love looks like and what it means to love him back. He wants you to pour out your heart and your hurts to him. To allow that resurrective power to come into your life. You might be saying, well, that's just a little bit too late for me. It's never too late. Never too late to give your brokenness to God. We're all broken. We've all been broken. But God wants to give you a contagious hope. God has been preparing you for this entire moment. You might say, so what do I do? 
The Bible says this in Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that's what Easter is all about, you will be saved. Not might be saved, not, oh, your numbers might come around and if they do, yes, then you will be saved. No, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. To confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, what does it mean? It means that God, he's God and I'm not. He's God and I'm not. Lord means that you have a right to lead me because you are my creator. If I make you Lord of my life, I'm saying, Lord, you have the right to lead me as my creator. You are God. That's what it means to say Jesus is Lord. He's saying he's my Lord. He's the manager. He becomes the CEO of my life. To put a sign on your door, I'm under new management. Jesus is my Lord. He is God of my life. I want to invite you to stand this morning. Usually at this point of the service, I say let's all close our eyes and bow our heads, but in this part today, I actually want everyone to keep their eyes open. I want everyone to be looking up, not heads bowed. And I'd love you just to put your eyes on the screen. And I want all of us to read this prayer together. If you've never prayed this prayer before, this is the first step to the rest of your life in discovering who Jesus Christ really is and who he came to be. We're here to help you live out that decision that you're making, to live for Jesus. Some people think, well, I said the sinner's prayer, so I'm in. Now, the sinner's prayer is just like asking for more information, please. Yes, I'm going to accept God, Yes, I'm going to receive his grace and his forgiveness. Yes, I'm going to correct some of the things in my life, but I'm going to need his help to do that on a daily basis. It's not a a once prayer and keep living the same old life. It's a once prayer turning around my life and then discovering the fullness of what that decision actually means. So come on, let's read this together. We'll go slow so everyone can keep up. Dear God... Today, I accept all that Jesus did for me on the cross. Thank you for forgiving everything I've done wrong. Thank you that I don't have to fear death. Please put your spirit of love and power in me. Thank you that you never will stop loving me. I want to live for the purpose that you've created me for. I trust you to take me to heaven when I die. Amen. Now for some of you, it may not mean a whole lot. But if you sincerely meant what you've prayed today, and whether or not that's for a first time or you're rededicating your life to Jesus, let this be a moment, Easter 2023. Let it be a moment in your, in your spiritual journey where you can put a stake in the ground and say, that's when I gave my heart. To Jesus. That's when I trusted him with my future. It's called a moment of salvation. It's called a moment of becoming born again. It's an amazing time. If you prayed that prayer today for the first time, then we've got a gift for you in the foyer. It's actually called the Bible, the Word of God. And we want to put that in your hands so that as you read it, Our prayer is that the Spirit would bring those words alive to you and give you understanding about the decision and the prayer you've just prayed. If you want more information about that prayer, about anything about this message, come and talk to one of our leaders. They'll have a red lanyard on at the end of the service. You can email us at wecare at cotr.org.au. We're here to help you take that next step in God. So, Father God, on this Easter morning, Lord, we say thank you for all that you've afforded us through sending your Son, Jesus. Lord, we are so thankful that Jesus rose again to give us a future and a hope. 
Lord, we pray that that future and hope would mean something to us every moment of every day. Teach us what it means to love others as you've loved us. Teach us how to share the good news of Christ with other people by sharing our own story. Lord God, we pray for the furthering of your kingdom, the equipping of the saints through your Holy Spirit. Lord, and the blessed hope and assurance of your word to everyone who hears and receives your grace and forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to be towards you and his countenance upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and grant you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Hey, thanks for being with us today at Church on the Rise. We pray that you've gleaned something from the message that will actually help you in your walk with Jesus. If today you're making a decision to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Saviour, please drop us a line at wecare at cotr.org.au. We'd love to help you, give you resources, tips, tools, and walk with you in your discipleship journey. We pray God's best over you for the week ahead.